Bismillah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Assalatu wassalamu ala rasulillahi sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My dear brothers and sisters from all around the world, welcome to the Muslim Circle Ramadan Lockdown webinar series. My name is Brother Dean. I am your uh, moderator or host for tonight. Uh, Alhamdulillah, welcome, welcome again. If this is your first time uh, joining us, uh, this is uh, this Ramadan lockdown webinar series is done daily, where we bring um, we bring uh, speakers from all around the world every night, having a lecture every night, uh, straight to your home or wherever you are, inshallah. Hopefully, you're still at home uh, on lockdown. Um, today we have a um, oh yeah for. Forgot to mention, we are now live on Zoom and on Facebook. And then after the session, inshallah, we will post it onto a uh, YouTube channel. So we'll get more information on that later, inshallah. Today, uh, we have a special session, alhamdulillah. Today with us, we have Sheikh Abdul Wahab Salim. Uh, and he will be talking about a very timely reminder, a very uh, timely uh, uh, a very timely and needed, much needed reminder called To Allah We Shall Return. Uh, a little bit about uh, Sheikh. Uh, Sheikh is, uh, Sheikh Abdul Wahab Salim obtained his uh, bachelor's in fiqh and usul of fiqh with honors from uh, the King Saudi University in Saudi Arabia, uh, one of the, if not the highest ranking institution in the, the Middle East. Uh, while pursuing his university education, he studied uh, numerous classical works from uh, distinguished scholars, particularly under the tutelage of Sheikh Anwar Abdullah uh, Al Fadhari. Uh, he obtained licenses to teach numerous classical texts in all Islamic sciences, including fiqh, usul, uh, hadith, tafsir, uh, and aqidah, as well as uh, aqidah as well as qiraat. Uh, he is the founder and academic director of Salik Academy and an instructor at Mishka University. In, addi in addition to lecturing around the world, he has made appearances on various TV channels, TV stations, and YouTube channels, including Ramadan TV, Sharjah TV, The Daily Reminder, Huda TV, and more. Uh, Sheikh uh, is currently completing his uh, PhD at the International Islamic University uh, here in Malaysia, alhamdulillah. Uh, so without any further delay, I pass the virtual floor on to you, Sheikh. Faddal. Allahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, alhamdulillah, hamdan. يوافي نعمه ويكافئ مزيده وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا كريم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي رب زدني علما رب زدني علما رب زدني علما اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا Welcome all to this particular talk a very special talk a talk which is uh, catered to the type of circumstance we happen to be in today. A talk which is very relevant to the situation that Allah Rabbul Izzati Wal Jalal has placed us in during this particular uh, season of our lives. Uh, you know, the, the theme behind these Ramadan talks is, of course, Ramadan lockdown, okay, or lockdown in Ramadan. And uh, it goes without saying that we are all experiencing this theme as we speak on a daily basis. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has given us guidance in the Quran for every single thing that we go through within our lives and every junction that we have to cross and every position that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places us in. So the, it is because of this that I entitled the talk as I did, and that is that to Allah Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal we shall return. You see, all of us have heard the statement inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are for Allah, we are owned by Allah, we are under the care of Allah, we are under the possession of Allah, and it is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we will also return as well. But the context of this comment that Allah teaches us to say in the Quran is very telling of why we should be saying this and why we should be incorporating this message within our lives today. You see, Allah tells us in Surah Al-Baqarah, 
one verse before to Allah we belong and to Allah we will return, Allah says, Wala nabluwannakum. Of a surety and definitely, without any doubts. Okay? And we can say without any doubts to the power of three, because look, Allah says, Wala. And they say, Lam is supposed to denote emphasis. Lam is among the ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Arabic language, of course, as well, we denote emphasis within the Arabic language through this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, he will definitely test you. Then he brings another article or another particle of emphasis, which is the noon of tawqid. And tawqid, the noon of emphasis, there are two different types of noon of emphasis. There is the noon of tawqid, al thaqila and there is the noon of tawqid, al khafifa So there's two different types. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings us the stronger of the two types. Okay? He brings us the stronger of the two types. Now, I think I can use the board over here. I know this is going to be a strange uh, practice within your lessons, but why not? Because since I have the board to use, I might as well, shouldn't I? So I'm just going to write it down over here and say, wa la nab lu wa nakum, right? All right, this is what Allah is saying in the Quran here. Wa la nab lu wa nakum, all right? So what I was saying over here with a lot of things that perhaps people were not uh, completely grasping, which they will be able to now. This lamb here, this lamb right over here, is a lamb, is an article which is used for emphasis. So that's one emphasis right over there. Did everything leave off of the screen? Oh, that was very strange. Okay, well, here we are. Okay, so this lamb is a lamb of emphasis. So that's, the, to, that's to the power of one. And then we have this noon over here. These are not part, the essential parts of the verb that Allah is using. This noon over here is also a noon of emphasis. Now there's two different types of noons. There's a noon that just has a sukun on top of it. And there's another noon which has a shadda on top of it. This one is a noon of emphasis to the power of one. This one is a noon of emphasis to the power of two. And that's why I said, you can say, Allah is saying, I will surely and definitely test you, but not just to the power of one, but rather to the power of, of three. Okay? So Allah will definitely and surely test us. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us. These tests are going to come. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that there's many different types of tests, not just one type of test. And he tries to explain to us some of those tests. Jameel. Okay, let's cancel this and come back to life. All right. So there's going to be many different types of tests. And there will surely happen, not just to the power of one, rather to the power of three. Meaning, you're definitely going to be tested. I will definitely be tested. And how will those tests be? Well, those tests will be, بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ They will be uh, because of a little bit of difficulty. Okay. Some of those tests will be, through difficulty, through fear, rather, okay? So some of those tests will be that you will be afraid. Some of those tests will be that you will have hunger. Okay, well, jur, you'll have hunger as well, a drought and a hunger, and a, a drought which leads to the hunger, rather. Okay, وَنَقْسٍ مِنَ amwal, And also, Allah will make you lose some of your property and some of your wealth as well. anfus, And also, there will be loss of life involved as well. These are all going to be tests. And there will be loss of crops as well. And then Allah says, And give glad tidings to those people who happen to be patient. Now let me ask you a question. This crisis that we're in, which one of those tests does it fall into? Well, if we really ponder the verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will realize that it actually falls into every single one of those tests. There's not a single form of test that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, except that the crisis that we happen to be in, it falls into all of those forms. So are, we, is, are people afraid? Uh, you can bet yourself that they are, definitely. Okay. Uh, are people hungry? Well, there are many people out, the, out in the world that happen to be hungry as well, of course, without a doubt. Uh, did people lose wealth? I think that almost everyone in the world has lost some wealth because of this. Either 
because they're not going to work or because they've had to spend think, spend in ways that they never had to do in the past before, right? So there's a loss of wealth there. Is there loss of life? Yes, there definitely happens to be loss of life as well. I mean, right now, I don't know exactly what the number is, but the last I checked, it's getting close to 300,000 people who have died. So definitely there's loss of life as well. Well, anfus thamarat, is there loss of vegetation? Well, there is an opportunity lost, and that is that uh, people are not able to farm in the same way they were able to, and work is not continuing in the same way it used to. So because of that, there's also loss in vegetation as well. And there's loss in crops as well because of this. So there's a loss at every single front, and there is a fear of all of these. So when Allah says, I will definitely and of a surety and really test you, in this case, all of those tests that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was talking about, every single one of them happened to be true. And every single one of them happened to have occurred within the test that we're going through today. Now, Allah says, those people who experience this test, but they happen to be patient, give glad tidings to those who happen to be patient. Now, normally we know about patience. We've heard about patience. But in these verses, Allah will redefine patience in a way that perhaps you haven't thought about before. But let's talk a little bit about patience generally before we go to the next verse. You see, Allah has mentioned patience in the Qur'an. Considering all the different derivatives of the word patience, Allah has mentioned patience at least 103 times within the Qur'an. Okay? And they are in eight different forms. And that shows you how important patience is to Allah that He mentions it so many different types, uh, so many different type, times, in so many different variations, and in so many different contexts. At least 103 times one can count in the Quran that patience has have been mentioned. And at what should we be patient? And what leads, what does a person receive of ajr or reward if a person happens to be patient? Well, with the Prophet ﷺ, he told us of this in many a hadith, among which is a hadith in both Bukhari and Muslim, where the Prophet ﷺ said, مَا يُصِيبُ الْمُسْلِمَ مِن نَصَبٍ وَلَا وَصَبٍ وَلَا هَمٍ وَلَا حَزَنٍ وَلَا أَذَنٍ وَلَا غَمٍ حَتَّى الشَّوْكَةِ يُشَاكُهَا إِلَّا كَفَّرَ اللَّهُ بِهَا مِنْ خطايا. There's not any difficulty, there's not any pain and, and, and test and a trial and any... Uh, grief that a person experiences or any harm that a person experiences, ex even if it happens to be just a thorn that pricks him and pokes him, even that, except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends up expiating some of the sins that the person has committed. So all of those tests that Allah is placing us through, all we have to do is be patient and through those patience, that test will become a great bliss from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a great blessing from Allah Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal. You see, Sufyan al Thawri, rahimahullahu ta'ala, he used to say, Inna al ajru ala qadr al sabr. Your ajr, O oh dear slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will be through how much patience you have and how many, uh, how much you're able to endure and how much you uh, protect yourself from, from being what? From not believing in the decree of Allah and not accepting the decree of Allah, not accepting the choice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made for you. Look, I'm going to tell you something else. Now that we know that every single type of test that Allah described, we are actually going through it right now. And we have been going through it for the past uh, month, more than a month actually, for the past couple of months. We've been going through this particular test and not just one test, all the tests and all the different types of tests that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, all of them are being experienced simultaneously right now. I want to also give you a glad tiding. The reward of patience is such that Allah says, Allah gives the people who happen to be patient reward without calculation. And that's very, very beautifully coined within the Quran. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا يُوَصَّ الصَّابِرُونَ 
Indeed, those people who happen to be patient, they are given their reward without any calculations. So if you want reward without calculations for every single type of test that you happen to be experiencing and that we as humanity have happened to be experiencing, then the way to do that is through patience. And you can have patience at every single level, household. You see, there are different types of tests. Yes, they are. Each one of those you can face with patience. Now, even when it comes to patients, there are different types of patients as well. How so? Well, the scholars of Islam, they've told us that there are three different types of patients. How so? Well, the first of them is a type of patient that a, per patients that a person has when it comes to fulfilling the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed us through a test and that test is one of the tests actually is that we can't go to the masjid during this Ramadan a Ramadan in which we don't go to the masjid I mean you can't even imagine that type of Ramadan you can't go to the masjid subhanallah but we are experiencing it and it's become really hard for some of us to continue to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the same way that we would normally be worshiping Allah Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal during Ramadan. It's become really hard because you don't have the Imam to lead you in Taraweeh. It's become really hard because after uh, the Suhoor, you were so used to going to the Masjid to pray Salat al Fajr. It's become really hard because of those weekend iftars that the Masjid used to offer, which would allow you to feel the spirit of Ramadan. It's become really hard in all of those ways, but you are still enduring worshiping Allah. And we know that one of the types of patience is to be patient on fulfilling the worship of Allah and delivering the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and doing those things that are the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those helping factors and aiding factors that you used to have in Ramadan, you don't have today. But you still happen to be patient. And if you're not, if you happen to be patient, then Allah will increase your reward more than he would in normal Ramadanat. Because you know what? Every one of us is worried. Subhanallah, we cannot go to the masjid. What about Qiyamul Layl? Are we going to get the ajr for that? We cannot go to the masjid. What about this, that, or the other? Are we going to get ajr for that? Well, I want to give you a glad tiding that because of the difficulty and trial that Allah has placed you through, if and me, if we continue to worship Allah and if we continue to be patient upon the worship of Allah, now Allah will actually increase the reward because of the patience that you have. And because you usually ha had a habit of praying in Ramadan, in the masjid, inshaAllah ta'ala, even if you can't do it this month and your heart feels so, Allah will allow you to get that reward as well, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. So that's the first type of patience and you have an opportunity to adopt that type of patience within your life uh, through this trial that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed us to. The second type of patience is the patience from patience against the disobedience of Allah. So we had patience for the obedience of Allah. Now we have patience for against the disobedience of Allah Azza wa Jalla as well. So let me ask you, is there any disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you have to specifically be patient in during these trying times? Of course. When a person is by himself, alone, then as they say, that an absent mind happens to be Satan's playground. Now you may say, of course, shaitan happens to be locked up. And I'll say, yes, the evil shay shayateen, the greatest of shayateen happen to be locked up. But the things that they've been whis whispering throughout the year, they continue to linger within our minds. You see, shaitan being locked up doesn't mean evil will not occur. Don't you see that in Ramadan, evil continues to occur even though shaitan happens to be locked up? That is because the whispers of Satan continue to linger, even though the attack of Satan becomes weaker. But the whispers of Satan throughout the year, they continue to also linger as well. So when a person is absent-minded within, within this Ramadan, where a person is at home all the time, alone by himself, within his room, within her room, then there are chances that sins may occur, which otherwise wouldn't occur if a person was occupied. So this is your opportunity to not only have patience on the obedience of Allah, but patience also against 
the disobedience of Allah, which could occur because of the absent uh, mind that a person that some of us have today in our situation that we happen to be in. So you have the opportunity to have the second category of patients in this Ramadan as well. And the third and most important one and the most relevant one to the situation that we happen to be in. And that is the category of patients when dealing with the difficult and painful calamities that come to you through the dec decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at times. Allah has decreed upon humanity that they will be going through this COVID crisis. Allah has decreed upon humanity that people will be going through this painful and, and, and difficult pandemic that we happen to be going through. This is something that Allah has decreed upon humanity. So now you can deal with it in two different ways. You can start questioning the decree of Allah. Why did you do this to, to us, O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And that would be a door to disbelief. Or you can embrace that difficulty with patience and that will increase and that will raise your reward. Because Allah says in the Quran, Allah gives the reward to those people who are patients with that patient without calculations. So if you want that reward without calculations, then this is your opportunity. You embrace that difficulty with patience and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase your reward. Going on to the second verse, Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 156. Before we were looking at 155, now 156. Allah then says that the truly patient ones are the ones who do the following. الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ those people who are struck by, who when they are struck by calamities, they end up adopting patience and they say, they say what? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Surely to Allah we belong and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we shall return as well. Okay? So it's to Allah we belong, my dear brothers and my dear sisters, and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we shall return as well. The reason why this is very important, this comment to make is very important, is because it gives, gives you a reality check of your situation and your status. You are owned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You belong to Allah. Allah created you. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests you, he has the right to test you. And we will be returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well because the person who recognized that he will be returning to Allah, that person doesn't end up not embracing the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with patience. Rather, the person ends up embracing that decree of Allah, Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal, with patience because he realizes that one of the cornerstones of the faith of a person in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to believe in the divine decree and the divine destiny that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed for a person. When you recognize that, then you have to embrace it with patience because you know you will be faced by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. And that's why when we are struck by a calamity, we remind ourselves that we, are, we belong to Allah and to Him we will be returning. So how can we not accept this decree of Allah? Because if we don't, then on the day of judgment, we'll be answerable to Allah that we haven't accepted His decree. And hence, we haven't completely believed in the divine decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a comment, my dear brother and my dear sister, that a Muslim should make at every single calamity that befalls him. It is not just a comment that you make when someone dies, even though it is a comment that you make when someone dies as well. Rather, it is something that you say at every single calamity that befalls a Muslim. How do we know this? We know this because of a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, that one day the Prophet had a lantern, and that lantern ended up, the, the light within it, it ended up stopping. Okay, it, Something put out the light within that lantern. So when that happened, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. To Allah we belong and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we will be returning as well. Okay? To Allah we belong and to Allah Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal we will be returning as well. So some of the Sahaba they looked at the Prophet and they said, Oh Prophet of Allah, is this really a calamity that you're speaking of? Is this really a trial? Simply a lantern being put out? Is that a light being put out, is that a calamity, O Prophet of Allah? So the Prophet ﷺ said, everything that harms a believer in the slightest bit that happens to be a calamity and through that, the person will gain reward were he to be patient and were he to say these words and remind himself of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at, at that junction. 
inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un so when we are in this calamity of the covid crisis and this difficulty where we're not able to meet each other we're not able to communicate with each other uh, we are able to communicate but not directly at least we are not able to be in close vicinity of one another there are husbands and wives who are departed and apart there are children who are departed and they happen to be apart from their parents there are relatives uh, as well there are loved ones there are co-workers who happen to be unable to work with they're not able to work with one another because of the crisis in all these circumstances we say to ourselves inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we belong and to allah rabbul izati wal jalal we will also be returning as well now allah has redefined for you what patience means he has redefined for you that patience means that a person reminds himself at the moment of crisis about Allah. He reminds himself at the moment of crisis that Allah is the one who he will be answerable to on the day of judgment. If a person does this, then there's great reward. What is that reward? Well, Allah tells us in Surah Al-Baqarah, also in the very next verse, Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 157, Allah says, min wa rahmah." Upon these people, there will be salawat. What does salawat mean? Okay. I mean, all your life you've been saying sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. So what does salat mean? Well, salat is a word, it has a different meaning depending on the person who's saying it. So, so if you say, may Allah send his salawat upon ABC, upon the Prophet, upon other Prophets, okay? Upon individuals as well, you can even say that by the way. If you say that, then you're saying, may Allah have his special unique mercy on that person. Okay, so what does salawat mean? It means special, unique mercy from Allah when it happens to be from Allah. And if it happens to be from the angels, then it, it means istighfar. Then it means forgiveness, to seek forgiveness. So when you say, may Allah, may the malaika, may the angels send salawat upon the Prophet, you're saying, may they make dua for the Prophet to be forgiven. Okay, and when human beings use this word, then it means dua, simply making dua. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. So Allah says, oh who you believe, send salutations, send salat upon him, and also taslim as well. What is he saying? Make dua for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay? So this is very important to understand this verse. Those people who are patient and who, when they are faced by a calamity, they say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. These are the people who will be placed within the salawat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does that mean? They will be placed within the pardon of Allah. They will be placed within the mercy of Allah. They will be placed within the blessings of Allah. They will be placed within the, within the status of honor granted by Allah in this dunya and in the hereafter as well. Now, in addition to that, this is a general word. Salat has multiple meanings, as I've already described. Okay? And some of the scholars, they said it actually, all those multiple meanings can be included when it comes from Allah. So, or many of them. So it could mean, it could mean pardon. It could mean mercy. It could mean blessings. It could mean honor. All of those could be meant by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here. So the person who says, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, when he's struck by a calamity and does not complain except that one comment, to Allah we belong and to Allah we will be returning, then Allah will place him in his pardon. Allah will place him in his blessings. Allah will honor him in this dunya and the hereafter. And Allah will be merciful to him as well. Now, that mercy doesn't just stop at the mercy, the general mercy within the word salat. Rather, Allah re-utters and reiterates the mercy yet again. When he says, they will have salawat, all of those meanings which I've described, and they will have mercy in addition to that as well, as in mercy upon mercy. So Allah will grant those people who are patient and simply say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, at the moment of crisis, and they don't say anymore, they will be granted mercy upon mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And let's not stop there because Allah doesn't stop there. He says, and those are the people who are rightly guided as well. Because this is the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the moment of 
truth and at the moment of calamity. And these are the people who are truly guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you wish to have the right guidance within these circumstances, Allah is giving it to you over here. Look at this. Beautiful verse and the beautiful application of this verse or these verses within the circumstances we happen to be in. The circumstances fit right in to the beginning of the verse. And that is that we are tested today, my dear brother and my dear sister, because of fear and through fear. Because all of us are afraid that we might become sick and all of us are afraid that we might catch the, the, the COVID virus as well. And uh, all of us happen to be going through as humanity, even if individuals are, aren't as humanity, we happen to be going through a hunger crisis. All of us pretty much, ha most of us, except for Zoom of course, most of us happen to be going through a loss of property and wealth as well. Most of us happen to be going through a loss, loss of life as well. We have a relative or a second cousin or a friend of a friend, someone we know has died depending on where we're stationed. But at least as humanity, all of us have been impacted. Every single country or most countries have been impacted with loss of life as well. And in addition to that, we've lost the opportunity to harvest. We've lost the, many opportunities to grow crops, etc. So every single calamity described by Allah in this verse and every single test is applicable to us in our situations. And we are to be patient. And when we are, Allah gives us a glad tiding. And that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send upon us salawat, his beautiful mercy, his pardon, his pardon, his honor. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also grant us from his blessings as well. Okay. And in addition to that, a very special mercy will be granted to us as well. And last but not least, that will be the correct way to deal with the circumstance. Those people who do this and apply this, they will be the ones who are truly guided by Allah. Guided to what? Guided to two things. Number one, they are guided to how to deal with the crisis. Okay? How to deal with the calamity. And how to deal with their grief and perhaps anxiety that may occur because of the calamity. You see, when a person perfects his belief in the divine decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the chances of anxiety, the chances of depression are far less potent and are far less uh, it's it's far less likely as well okay so when you have belief in the divine decree of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you end up insulating yourself to some degree against anxiety and against depression as well this is very important because many people who complain from depression they end up complaining and we find that the patients of depressions, okay, the people who happen to be patients of depression, when we look at the statistics, we find that the number of patients who happen to be, de who happen to be affected by depression and don't have a belief in God and don't have a belief in divine decree is greater than those who are the other way around and those who actually believe in God and they believe in divine decree as well. So when you believe in divine decree, you end up insulating yourself against depression. This doesn't mean that some people may not be depressed even if they believe in divine, divine decree. Yeah, that may also be the case as well. But what I'm saying over here is that there's far less likely of chances to become depressed and be a patient of anxiety when a person happens to have belief in divine decree. Why? Well, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the Quran. He says that, So that you don't end up becoming depressed and you don't become anxious because of what you lost and what you gained. When you have belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine decree, then you don't have that as much. Even if there are some people who have it, we're saying the chances become a lot less. And that's why the scholars of Tafsir, in regards to this verse, in regards to the guidance, they said those are the people who have been guided to making the calamity easier upon themselves and decreasing the effects of anxiety upon themselves as well. 
Number two, and the second meaning of the guidance is that those are the people who've been guided to gain the complete reward, and those are the people who've been guided to be granted the best of compensation as well. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us this guidance. Allahumma ameen. And last but not least, Umar ibn Khattab, he mentioned regarding this verse when he read it, he said, after the people became patient upon the calamities and upon the tests that Allah had granted them, how beautiful is the compensation that Allah grants? He says, Ni'mal Adlan wa Ni'mal Alawa. How beautiful is the abs is the great compensation that Allah is granting? The two ways of compensating that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is granting. What are the two compensations? Number one, salawat. Number one, mercy, pardon, uh, blessings, honor, and all of those meanings. Number two, mercy itself, in addition to the mercy which is already included within salawat. And then he says, and how beautiful is also the bonus that Allah grants. And that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants the people who are patient at this calamity, he grants them the title of the guided ones. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us his mercy, his salawat, and also to grant us as well the bonus, which happens to be the title of the guided ones. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among the guided ones. Allahumma ameen. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. And now we'll stop for a few questions. إن شاء الله. جزاكم الله خيرا. جزاك الله خير الشيخ. ما شاء الله. Very good and timely reminder. الحمد لله. Brothers and sisters, those who are watching on Zoom and on Facebook, if you have any questions, do send them in on to on to the Q and A session section on Zoom. And also in the comments uh, section on uh, Facebook, right? So I will uh, I will try to, my best to get to all of those questions. Uh, mashallah, for for the past few sessions, uh, Sheikh, we had uh, quite a number of questions. The the, the Q and A sessions were as long as the session itself, or so the talk, or even longer. So Alhamdulillah, uh, that's good. So if you have any questions, please send them in on the Q and A section or the comment section on Facebook. Um, Sheikh, now. Uh, this reminder that you gave, um, I, I, I always remember uh, Sheikh Daoud, uh, Sheikh Daoud Bhatt from Canada, he gave a similar reminder a few years ago, um, and he said that uh, the, the phrase or, or, or the, the saying, inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiun, is actually a reminder for us, the living, uh, not so much something for the one that has passed, not a dua per se for the one that has passed. Yes. Right. Yeah. So then, uh, and and that's it's very that's to me that's very important because I think there's a lot of people who misunderstand that, um, that thinking that oh you know uh, this is something that you're supposed to say for the dead uh, instead of you know do Allahumma firlahu warhamhu and so on. Uh, so, and alhamdulillah, this reminder is good. But now we live in an age where we are very. How do you say? We have a very short attention span. Our memory is very weak compared to the people of the past, right? Our, our, our uh, pious predecessors and so on. Um, what are some of the practical ways that you can suggest that we can remind ourselves that, uh, yes, we, death is coming? I heard that some, I uh, can't remember, was it a Sahaba or, or Tabi'een? They kept his own, uh, kept his own uh, kafan uh, cloth under his bed. You know, uh, we hear a lot that uh, we hear a lot that some of uh, Mashaykh keep reminding us, telling we should visit the grave to remind us of uh, what's coming, right? Um, and again, I ask this because you know, talk after talk, we get reminders like this. Alhamdulillah, it's good, it's needed, but we as human beings, we are tangible. Beings, we need things that we can perceive, that we can touch, like the like the kafan clothes, for example, right? So, what are some practical steps or practical things that we can uh, practice uh, that you would suggest? So that's a that's a good uh, question there. Now, uh, in terms of the practical tips regarding reminding ourselves of the of death. Before that, I want to talk about something that is uh, also very relevant as well. And I kind of alluded to it within my talk. And that is that 
the word inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un or the comment inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un to Allah we belong and to Allah we shall return as well this is not a comment that is specific to the moment at which people die even though that is the most common moment in which we say this particular word or this statement and sentence so it's most often heard when someone dies and you hear of a death of an individual you say inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un but in essence, these words are prescribed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the moment of any type of calamity. And as we know in the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ had a lantern and that lantern, someone put it out or it ended up, uh, the light ended up going out on it. And, that, and even at that juncture, even at that moment, the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. So this is something that we remind ourselves of, uh, remind ourselves of why? Because this reminder keeps us in check that everything that happens to us, if we're not patient at that moment, then we will be questionable of it for it on the day of judgment. Okay? No matter what that may be, whether it be someone's death and we start to wail and cry uh, in a way which is unkempt, whether that be, uh, whether that be us losing some money, whether that be us losing some property, whether that be us having some pain within our bodies, whatever happens at that moment, we remind ourselves that, hey, look, I'm going through a difficulty. I've been commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to believe. And if I don't believe, and if I don't accept the decree of Allah, then I will be faced by Allah on the day of judgment. And that will be not a very good situation to be in because I did not accept the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I treated and I faced and I dealt with the decree of Allah in a negative way instead of being positive, instead of recognizing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't test us except that he knows we're able to handle this test, okay? So that's why we remind ourselves of this at every moment of calamity and every moment of crisis and every moment of difficulty, no matter what type of difficulty that may be, no matter how severe it is or no matter, no matter how easy and light it is as well, okay? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. So that's the first uh, part. The second part is how do we remind ourselves of, of death and how do, how do we continue to remember death continuously and why should we remember death as well? Well, firstly, because the Prophet recommended for us to remember death when he said, remember death, which ends up breaking all of the, all of the feelings of joy that you have within your life. Because sometimes people end up getting too occupied with joy which ends up leading them to not completely submitting themselves and committing themselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet ﷺ reminded us to remember death. And how do we remember death? Well, the Prophet told us also in a hadith, he said that I had told you, Kuntu nahaytukum an ziyaratil qubur, ala fazuruha. I had told you in the past not to visit the graves, and now I'm telling you to go ahead and visit the graves, fa innaha tudhakkirukum al akhira, because it is a reminder for the day of judgment. It ends up reminding you of the day of judgment. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the ability to understand this. That by visiting the graves and seeing the people who've already been deceived and uh, who've already been uh, deceived by this dunya, some of, some of them at least, and seeing the people who've already died as well, these are ways that we can bring ourselves the reminder of death as well and continue to have that death within our minds. In these times, the question really is, how do you not remind yourself of death? I mean, the circumstances that we're in at the current moment, even those who are heedless in the past today, they're constantly remembering death. That's why everywhere you go, it looks apocalyptic. Everybody's got a mask on, everybody's got gloves on, everybody's social distancing. I mean, the question really is, how can you not remind yourself of death? By Allah, the one who doesn't remember death within this crisis, by Allah, that person doesn't have a heart. Or if he has, that heart is as hard as a rock. Because at this junction, is it even possible for a person not to remember death? Even those who didn't, don't believe, even those who happen to be atheists, everyone is concerned of death at the moment. So right now, the question is not, how do we remind ourselves of death? How do we benefit most of this reminder? Because the reminder of death is definitely already there. How do we benefit most? Well, we benefit most by changing our ways, 
Those who have died, they're already gone. They've already gone and they're going to be faced with the, with the reward or the compensation or the punishment for what they had done. Now it is your opportunity and my opportunity and a blessing for Allah upon us for us to be able to change our ways before it's too late. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to change our ways. Ameen, Ya Rabbi Alameen. Ameen, Ameen. Um, Zakallah here for that. Uh, next one, the next question is, um, this phrase, in Allah wa inna ilayhi rajoon, also, uh, sorry, uh, is, is to understanding this, understanding this phrase is to completely surrender yourself to the will of Allah. To the Qadr of Allah. Yeah. We understand that, but there's one big obstacle standing in the way, which is fear. Because what we have lost or are, or are at risk of losing uh, that are tangible and have direct impact on, on our lives. So how do we deal with this fear? Okay, that's, a, that's also a good question. Well, uh, fear itself is not necessary. Okay. Fear is a very good thing if you channel it in the correct way. And Allah had told us, of course, in the verses that I read to you as well, that one of the tests that he'll grant you is the test of fear as well. Okay. So it's undoubted that fear can be channeled in two different ways. The first way is that we end up taking fear and because of that, we end up getting away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is something that people do as well. They end up using this fear to kind of complain and say, why would you put me through this, O Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Okay? That's one way of dealing with it. And the second way, and any test, by the way, there are people out there who take any test and start questioning the decree of Allah. And the other way is instead of saying that, we say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we remind ourselves as well that we are for Allah and to Him we'll be returning. So let's embrace this fear and accept it and let's realize that it is but a test and patience in these circumstances will again increase our reward. Inshallah. Um, the next question is, uh, this phrase also underlines the fact that all that we have belongs to Allah. All that we have is Allah. Our wealth, our family, our health, etc. But when we live in a world that is, um, in a world and a time that is overly materialistic, uh, how do we detach ourselves from our worldly desires? Uh, not totally, but to achieve a balance between the two worlds. Yeah. How do we detach ourselves from the worldly desires, especially in the light of this particular phrase, which reminds us that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we belong and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will return. Look, uh, it all goes back to intellect. And the Arabs have many, many different ways of, um, of understanding intellect, okay? Of uh, expressing the word intellect within their language. And each one of these words is actually a word which has a connotation within it which help us realize how we can detach ourselves from this world through the concept of intellect okay now uh, how should i explain this the way to explain this would be i'm going to have to go back to the board you know actually to be honest with you i'm a teacher at a college and I've been teaching at colleges and universities for the past uh, long time. So I like to use the whiteboard more than right. other people. And that's why I'm really enjoying these Zoom classes because they give me the opportunity to use, to use the boards. Okay. All right. So, aqala and naha. These are two words. I'm not going to use all of the words, but these are two, two different words, which are Arabic words for intellect. Okay, one of the words is aqal, and well, we can use the verbal noun, noun, why not? Okay, so we'll go for the verbal noun instead. Haqlun. And then the other one would be nuhiyatun. Now for those of you who know Arabic and those who don't, you should learn it, because it's the language of the Quran. 
Okay. And both of these words, by the way, are used by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran as well. So for example, Allah says, Ulinnuha. So this is that usage. And aql is all over the Quran, so I don't even need to give you an example. Okay? Now, now that we know both of these words, what does this mean? And what does this mean? Okay, what does this mean? So aql basically comes from the word aqala. Aqala. Which means to block. It also means to comprehend as well. But it also means block as well. And nuhya, it comes from the word naha. Naha, which means to do what? Which also means to forbid or to stop or so on and so forth. Okay? Jamil. Now, why am I saying all of this? I know it sounds very Arabic and very difficult, but it's okay. Um, sometimes concepts have to be difficult in order for them to really be understood. Okay? So, aql, it means to block something. Naha, it means to forbid something or to stop something. Okay? Let's write down the meaning over here. And these are the root words for two of the many words within the Arabic language for intellect. Both of which are used by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within the Quran as well. To block or to forbid. The scholars of the Quran and the scholars of the Arabic language and people who are natives of the Arabic language know that the reason why intellect, intellect is known as aql, which means to block. Okay? Intellect being aql right over here. The reason why aql or intellect is known as, as aql is because aqala means to block because intellect blocks a person from foolish actions. And the reason why intellect, another word for intellect, is nuhya, and it it comes from the word naha, which means to forbid, is because intellect ends up forbidding a person, again, from all sorts of stupidities. Okay? So when you have a brain, then you won't have a problem with this particular question. And that is that your intellect will stop you from being connected to a life which happens to be transitory. Your nuhiya will stop you and forbid you from being connected to a life which happens to be transitory because you'll recognize that in the greater scale of things, transitory compared to eternity is absolutely nothing. Okay? Literally, when you compare, no matter how long of this world you compare to eternity, it ends up coming down to zero because any number next to eternity equals zero. So if Allah is saying you do this, that, the other, and you get eternity of bliss versus uh, you don't do this, that, or the other, and then you get eternity of, of Jahannam, then obviously... Uh, you would rather forego the pleasures of this life to be granted the eternal bliss of Jannah. Okay? And what can stop you from being connected to the worldly life to a degree that you end up uh, being immersed in it and forgetting the hereafter? Intellect in a mind. That's why they said the Prophet ﷺ was the best and most kempt and most capable and most uh, noble of people because they said nobility is very connected to intellect. The more intelligent a person is, the more noble he usually ends up being. Not all the time, but many at times. Why? Because that intelligence stops the person from, from doing all evils and behaving, and rather he, it ends up encouraging him to behave in the correct and noble way. And Al-Qadi Ayyad, in his book, Kashifa, he actually mentioned that intellect and the superiority of the Prophet ﷺ in intellect was what led him to be the way he was in terms of his manners, in terms of his etiquette, in terms of his behavior. I hope that's clear. Inshallah. Um, I think this is, yeah, this is the last question. Um, this question is coming from a revert. Sheikh. Um, Salaamu Alaikum, Sheikh. Uh, you said that we can make a salawat for anyone. Will it be offensive to use the same words of Darut-i-Sharif? 
I'm not sure what that is. If you if you do, then yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, the same words of Darut is Sharif for another person. Yeah, that's the question. Okay, that's a good question. Uh, will it be offensive to use the same word as uh, Darut Sharif, which is also another? Uh, well, a Salat al Ibrahimiya is. Can you hear me? Uh, sorry, Jay. Can you repeat that? Sorry. Sorry. Uh, when you plugged your mic in, we lost a few seconds of the audio. So can you plug it in then? Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. Let me plug it back in. Okay. So uh, this is a very good question. I said in the middle of my lecture that Salat can actually be sent upon other people as well. Okay. Now, uh, I'm going to actually take a back step and detail the issue a little bit more. Okay, because sometimes whenever we give like half of the information, it ends up actually uh, causing some sort of uh, misconceptions. Uh, and uh, so that I, because of that, I need to, to kind of take a back step to explain in a bit more detail. Okay, so salla literally means a number of different things, some of which I've already told you. Okay, so among the meanings of a salat, ala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, if it comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's mercy. If it comes from the angels, it happens to be istighfar. If it comes from people, it's just simply dua. Originally, the word salat in the Arabic language, prior to the advent of Islam, the primary meaning of the word salat in the Arabic language happened to be dua. Okay? So when you used to send salat upon someone, obviously, nowadays, we think of salat upon the Prophet from Allah or the angels or us. Or we think when we hear the word salat, we think of the five daily prayers that we pray. Before Islam, the word salat simply meant dua, okay? It meant dua, which is to supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So can you supplicate with the word salat on anyone else? Well, yes, you can, technically speaking, okay? But it is through the social conscious of people that they have limited the term salat to the prophets. Okay, and they have specified the term radiyallahu anhum to the sahaba, and they have specified the term rahimakallah or Allah yarham to other human beings. None of these are rules that are hard and fast. Okay, this means that I can say to Munir, I can say to anyone, I can say radiyallahu anhu. Or I can say radiyallahu anhu. Or I can say salla alayk. I can say all of these things. But is this how people generally do it? Is that how it's become normal? Is that how it's kind of uh, uh, coined by the, the conscious of the, the ummah? Not really. And that's why it's not advisable to use this particular term when you say, uh, for example, you say, uh, Shaykh Abdul Wahab sallallahu alayhi. You don't do that. Why? Because then the first listener might mistake you to mean that Abdul Wahab is actually a prophet. Even though technically speaking, in meaning, there's nothing wrong with it. Okay? This is why we say that avoid doing this even if it is technically considered okay. Why? Because of the fact that the listener might end up getting confused that you're trying to use this particular term for a prophet because now people have kind of uh, understood that Salat equals Prophet Allah equals the Sahaba and Rahim Allah equals regular human beings other than the Prophets and other than the companions. Now, are you allowed to change within the Dua of Salat al ibrahimiyya I think that question doesn't really matter anymore if you consider the first part uh, that I've given you or the first part of the answer. So I'll cease to answer the second part because uh, my uh, recommendation is that you don't send Salat uh, in that way upon regular people because you will be causing confusion uh, when it comes to the listener and the person who hears you saying sallallahu ala fulan and you're referring to really a human being other than the prophets uh, wallahu ala. okay right uh, for that um, I think that's it for all our questions Zakla here for that uh, wonderful lecture and uh, reminder. Uh, for those of you, my dear participants, and uh, those who are viewing on Zoom and Facebook, if you just joined in, uh, 
Um, if you just joined in and missed half of the, or a little bit of the uh, lecture, uh, don't worry, the, the, the video will be posted on our Facebook and our YouTube uh, channels. Uh, just go on to Facebook and YouTube, look for Muslim Circle O, right? Muslim Circle O uh, on Facebook, YouTube, and uh, Instagram, and you'll find the videos there, inshallah. Jazakallah um, khair. I hope you guys have, uh, have a good, um, inshallah, good, uh, May Allah grant us Laylatul Qadr in these last 10 nights, increase our efforts in, uh, in uh, hunting for Laylatul Qadr. Um, with Allah. That, um, and speaking of the last 10 nights, please join us again, the same time, same virtual place, uh, tomorrow, uh, where we have Sheikh Gabriel Al-Romani talking about, his, the title of his uh, talk will be, uh, being an alpha male in the last 10 nights. So uh, with that, Jazakallah uh, khair, Shaykh Abdul Wahab Salim. And Jazakallah khair to all our participants and viewers. Uh, see you again same time um, tomorrow. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.